Good morning. I'm United States Attorney Zachary Cunha. Thank you for joining us here today. Appreciate you being here. We are here this morning to announce federal charges against Recovery Connections of America, a local and regional provider of addiction, counseling, and treatment services, as well as two of that company's leaders. Its owner, Michael Breyer of Newton, Massachusetts, and former employee Meok Bruning of Warwick, Rhode Island, who worked as a supervisory counselor. Both defendants were taken into custody this morning and were charged with carrying out what we allege to have been a massive health care fraud scheme that deprived patients of the treatment that they needed and resulted in millions of dollars of insurer billings for addiction treatment and therapy services that were grossly less than claimed, impacting roughly 1,500 patients who utilized Recovery Connection services primarily here in Rhode Island as well as in neighboring Massachusetts. And before I go any further, I'd like to welcome Special Agent in Charge Philip Coyne from the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Special Agent in Charge Joseph Bonavolanta from the FBI's Boston Division, both of whom you'll hear from in just a few moments. Thank you both gentlemen for being here with us today. Also joining me this morning are First Assistant United States Attorney Sarah Bloom and Assistant U.S. Attorney Kevin Love Hubbard, who are leading this prosecution and who have overseen the superb investigative work of these agencies that brings us to where we are today. I'd also like to thank our federal law enforcement colleagues at the IRS and our state counterparts from the Office of Rhode Island Attorney General Peter Nerona for their assistance in the course of our investigation. I'll introduce our final guest in just a moment. The heart of this case is simple. As we allege in a criminal complaint filed in federal district court and unsealed today, under the guise of running recovery clinics that supposedly provided much needed medical and therapy services to men and women in Rhode Island and Massachusetts who needed help in their struggles with addiction, these defendants in fact shortchanged their patients, providing them with little or no therapy and support while at the same time billing Medicare and other insurers as if they had. For example, by billing for 45-minute therapy sessions when patients were really seen for less than 15 minutes, in some cases substantially less than that, and by billing for so many therapy sessions in one day that it would have been physically impossible for a provider to have conducted the sessions. As reflected in the complaint, according to one witness, Defendant Bruning was known as the, quote, five-minute queen, sessions would last no longer than that. In another instance, a former employee was equipped with a bell that they would ring to ensure that the flow of patients moved along briskly and all the while recovery connection billed for 45-minute treatment sessions that patients didn't get. We also allege that Michael Breyer, who is not a doctor, but who is a previously convicted federal felon guilty of tax evasion and criminal contempt, used real doctors' DEA license numbers without those doctors' uh, knowledge or uh, permission to fill Suboxone and Buprenorphine prescriptions. We also allege that Mr. Breyer sought to obstruct the investigation by creating a false and backdated document to try and cover up for his past false submissions. Now, as we stand here today, we are all painfully aware of the ways in which Rhode Island and New England in general continues to wrestle with the ravages of the opioid crisis. And we are equally mindful of the fact that the devastation that addiction wreaks across our communities touches us all, no matter who we are, where we live, or what we do. And while this office remains emphatically committed to vigorously prosecuting those who are engaged in the significant and violent trafficking of illegal drugs in our communities, our response to the opioid crisis, to the lethal dangers of fentanyl, to the ravages of addiction, that response, if it's going to be effective, cannot come from law enforcement alone. Addressing the disease and crisis of addiction requires not just robust law enforcement targeting the drug supply, but support for medically assisted treatment, for medical interventions like naloxone or Narcan, making those widely available and accessible in our communities, and for medically sound recovery and treatment programs that people can access without stigma. And that's what makes the fraud scheme that we have charged today so particularly pernicious, that not only was this scheme, as we allege, designed to defraud by enriching these defendants with federal and private health care dollars that they did not earn, 
but that in the process, it cheated a vulnerable population of recovery patients out of the full and genuine support and treatment that they needed to have a chance at recovery. Today's charges should serve notice that we're not going to stand by in the face of this kind of fraud that victimizes a vulnerable population by shortchanging them of critical help while defendants help themselves to the federal taxpayer's dollar in the process. But equally, we're going to do so in a way that does not compromise access to vital recovery resources. And on that point, I would like to introduce, recognize, and thank Commander Patrick Newbert on detail from the U.S. Public Health Service, who serves as the Inspector General for Health and Human Services representative on the Opioid Rapid Response Program. The response program's mandate is to provide support and referrals to individuals who need recovery services when law enforcement takes action against a service provider, as we have today. To the extent that patients become unable to receive services and treatment at their existing locations, the response program and the Rhode Island and the Massachusetts Departments of Health are fully briefed, involved, and ready to provide referrals and ensure continuity of care care that each and every patient of Recovery Connections expects, deserves, and that the government or private insurers are paying for. I'd like to thank Commander Newbert, the response team, as well as the state health departments of both Rhode Island and Massachusetts for their support and coordination in ensuring that today's arrests and charges do not deprive patients of medication and treatment that they depend on. Any Rhode Island or Massachusetts patient of Recovery Connection impacted by today's action who cannot obtain their medication or therapy at their existing treatment location should reach out to the numbers shown here. We'll make those available online as well. Those numbers will provide them with help connecting with a provider who can ensure that they retain the ability to access prescription treatment for opioid use disorder and can put them in touch with providers who can get them the counseling and support services that they need. And with that, I'll turn this over for some brief remarks to Special Agents Coyne and Bona Volanta, and then to uh, Commander Newbert, and then we'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, United States Attorney Zach Kuna. Um, I would like to commend my colleagues here today for their unwavering commitment to ending the opioid epidemic. The Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General, our mission is to safeguard federal programs such as Medicare and Medicaid from fraud to protect the well-being of the patients that are served by those programs. Over 100,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses last year. Millions of people are currently affected by opioid addiction. Overdose rates in New England are among the highest in the nation. Drug addiction has touched many of us personally, through our families, and through the community. HHS OIG is dedicated to put, putting patients at the center of our work by investigating and bringing to justice those health care providers who participate in illegal activity and endanger the health and well-being of those patients. Our dedicated team of investigators, alongside our FBI partners, work tirelessly to detect, prevent, mitigate and mitigate opioid-related fraud, waste and abuse, and HHS programs. We, ex we expect providers to bill honestly, nothing more, nothing less. Unfortunately, health care providers who put personal profit above the safety of the patients, they actually play a large part in prolonging and exasperating the opioid epidemic at the expense of the American taxpayer. Healthcare providers who seek to enrich themselves by submitting false and inflated claims to Medicare and Medicaid and private insurers, as alleged in this case, will be held accountable and prosecuted. The Office of Inspector General will also continue to exclude healthcare providers from participating in federally funded programs when they're convicted of these crimes. Um, as, 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 AUS, as U.S. Attorney Cunha mentioned earlier, We've coordinated with the Rapid Opioid Response Team in both Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And on behalf of the Inspector General, I'd like to personally thank Patrick for being here. And before I turn the mic over to SAC from the FBI, I'd like to personally thank the FBI for the ongoing continuing partnership with HHS with this common mission.
Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Blunavalanta. I'm the Special Agent in Charge of the FBI Boston Division. Today, Special Agents with the FBI and HHS OIG arrested Michael Breyer, who was accused of carrying out a wide-ranging scheme in which he allegedly used our healthcare system for his own personal gain, taking advantage of vulnerable patients seeking opioid addiction treatment in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We safely took him into custody at his home in Newton, Massachusetts, where we're also seizing his residence, which is valued at close to $2 million, along with two vehicles, a 2020 Mercedes-Benz and a 2019 Lexus. Additionally, we're seizing the Recovery Connection Centers of America's headquarters right here in Providence. We believe this convicted felon, tax evader, and CEO stole millions of dollars until the proverbial mile-long paper trail and dozens of interviews our investigators obtained exposed him, along with his alleged nefarious billing practices, his unlicensed practice of medicine, and his fraudulent application for Medicare provider status. In addition to issuing Suboxone prescriptions in another physician's name, Mr. Breyer and his company are also accused of accomplishing the impossible working and billing Medicare and other insurance providers for more psychotherapy sessions than there are hours in a day. For example, on one occasion, Recovery Connection Centers of America billed taxpayers for 38 different patients, claiming they each received 45 minutes of counseling, totaling 28 and a half hours in one day, which as we all know, doesn't add up. Equally troubling, is that we believe Michael Breyer tried to obstruct our investigation by creating a false backdated document to cover up his fraudulent billing practices that shortchanged patients struggling with addiction out of the treatment they needed. And Michael Breyer didn't pull this alleged scheme off by himself. Earlier this morning, we also arrested Miak Bruning, a clinical supervisor who we believe hired and trained the chain's counselors on how to fraudulently bill, instructing them to only see patients for five to 10 minutes at most. She was taken into custody without incident at her home in Warwick. The allegations set forth in this case represent one of the most brazen and egregious examples of healthcare fraud the FBI has seen here in Rhode Island in recent history. We believe Michael Breyer, as the CEO of Recovery Connection Centers of America, tried to conceal and launder the millions of dollars in fraudulent proceeds the company received through investment accounts, the purchase of luxury vehicles, student loan payments, home renovations, and we found tens of thousands of dollars that went toward an oceanfront resort in Panama. Most reprehensible is the fact that these alleged crimes were carried out on the backs of the most vulnerable those struggling with substance abuse dependency seeking to get their lives back on track to become productive members of society. Healthcare fraud, including fraudulent billing schemes, cost taxpayers tens of billions of dollars every year. These crimes impact all of us in many ways, including increased health insurance premiums, greater out-of-pocket expenses, and co-pays for medical treatment, and reduced or lost benefits, just to name a few. The FBI, HHS OIG, and our other law enforcement partners are working hard every day to combat healthcare fraud schemes like the one we're highlighting here today. But we can't do it alone. We need the public's help to identify, investigate, and prosecute these crimes. If you suspect healthcare fraud, we urge you to report it to us and your healthcare insurance provider. This investigation is the result of two years worth of hard work and I'd like to thank the agents, analysts, and accountants in our FBI office here in Providence for their perseverance over that time, HHS OIG and their team for their partnership along the way, and United States Attorney Zach Kuna and his prosecutors for their outstanding collaboration. This was truly a team effort. Thank you. Thank you, Special Agents Coyne and Bonavolanta, Patrick. If you'd care to say a few words. Morning. 
I'm Commander Patrick Newbert, U.S. United States Public Health Service, and serve as the Opioid Rapid Response Coordinator for HHS OIG. And I want to thank U.S. Attorney Kunha, H HHS OIG Special Agent in Charge Coyne, and uh, FBI Special Agent in Charge Bonavolanta for your support of protecting patients that may be disrupted by this action. HHS OIG is a partner with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Opioid Rapid Response Program, an interagency uh, coordinated federal, eff federal, federal effort to help mitigate overdose risk among patients who lose access to prescribers of opioids of medications for o medications for opioid use disorder or other controlled substances such as benzodiazepines. This CDC program helps facilitate care continuity and risk reduction for patients by alerting state health agencies about law enforcement events that might disrupt patients' access to care. In this case, over the past month, Opioid Rapid Response Por Program coordinators have engaged with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, and the Rhode Island Department of Health, uh, Rhode Island Department of Behavioral Health Care, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals to prepare to assist patients experiencing disruption in care in the event a treatment clinic is no longer operational. We want to thank our colleagues at CDC's Opioid Rapid Response Program, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the Rhode Island Department of Behavioral Health Care for their coordination efforts to assist patients of this practice. For patients who may find they may need a new health care provider, resources for residents of Rhode Island and Massachusetts have been identified. Massachusetts residents needing a bridge prescription for medication for opioid use disorder may contact 617-414-4175. Rhode Island residents needing a bridge script for medication for opioid use disorder may contact the 24-7 buprenorphine hotline at 401-606-5456. For patients needing referrals to treatment in Massachusetts, they may also contact the helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050. Rhode Island residents may also contact the 24-7 Behavioral Health Triage Center at 401-414-5465 to be referred to another provider. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. Thank you again for being here with us today. Uh, are there any questions? How did this first come to your attention at OIG? Uh, this first came to our attention through billing analysis. Who did it? Who, who was doing well, I can't comment on the ongoing investigation, but generally that analysis is done by both federal and private payors as well as state and federal authorities. And how many patients are we talking about that were getting the prescription health care charges? Well, the chain or practice services approximately 1,600 to 1,800 patients. Roughly 900 of those are here in Rhode Island, the remainder in Massachusetts. Have you been able to determine how much money is involved? You said millions, but have you been able to put a dollar figure on it? And how long the alleged scheme was in effect? How long was the recovery plan system was in adequate in operation? Well, uh, the centers opened in 2018. Um, and actually part of the scheme, part of what we allege is that uh, there were about $15 million total billings, private and federal. Um, and part of the allegations is that this center should never have opened uh, because our primary defendant, Mr. Breyer, uh, used false information to apply for uh, federal health care funding uh, using another individual's name and identifying information. That is our allegation, yes. Is that other person uh, involved in this investigation <coughs> that you, you used in that Oh, uh, no. That person is not a uh, current charged defendant. Given that you have a larger message for healthcare fraud in general and a message that you're trying to send to uh, the behavior? Well, I certainly hope so. I think there are two aspects to this. One is indicating that we are going to be good stewards of the public dollar and we're going to be attentive to this kind of billing fraud. And the second is we're going to be particularly attentive when the population that is impacted is the kind of vulnerable population that we're dealing with here. Or is this person getting away with this? Like that helper is this person that has, you know, how do you even conduct medical treatment from someone like that? The, like, how do you even get to that point of servicing people from someone that looks like a house? 
Well, I think medical practices come in all shapes and sizes. What we're focused on is what was going on inside, and what we're alleging what was going on inside here was fraud. How many other employees work there? I don't have the total number of employees uh, to hand, but we can get you that information. You mentioned some of them may have been involved in this scheme? Well, we have charged former employee Miok Bruning, the supervisory counselor, with this. Uh, there are, as you can see in the court filed affidavit, a number of individuals who were pressured or advised by the defendants we've charged to carry out the scheme. You mentioned that the, this person also can be alleged of fraud. Uh, permission from doctors, how, how does that happen? Like, did they, do doctors know about they, the, the usage of their numbers to get the medication? How, how does, uh, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, licenses individuals to prescribe certain narcotic drugs, including drugs like Suboxone and Buprenorphine that are used for the treatment of opioid use disorder. You have to have a special DEA number to prescribe those drugs. Our contention, our allegation, is that Mr. Breyer got a hold of another doctor's number, or rather a doctor's number, or multiple doctor's numbers, and used those to prescribe prescriptions without the doctor's consent. Is there headquarters or uh, Providence. The primary site is on Wickenden Street in Providence, which is depicted there on the poster. Are those doctors getting in any type of trouble, or are they just victims of uh, somebody scam? We have not alleged misconduct by those physicians. Were patients helpful in this investigation? Were they coming forward saying, hey, I got caught in this with, uh, with, with, with a therapist on this side of the fence, for example? Well, I want to be careful what I comment on, given that this is an ongoing matter in court, but as reflected in the affidavit and as Special Agent in Charge Bonavolanta referenced, there were a lot of individual interviews conducted in the course of this that supported our ultimate conclusions. Were there any deaths, opioid overdose deaths, of patients who were being treated by Recovery Connect and Center of America during this investigation? I can't comment on that. Can you just conclude the question that, uh, um, that this goes back to 2018, you mentioned all the number of patients that were not getting the care that they were supposed to get, five minutes versus 45 minutes. Can you just conclude what it was that these people were basically cheated out of over that length of time? Well, in brief, you know, treatment for opioid use disorder has a couple of components. One of them is potentially medication, like Suboxone or Buprenorphine, but it's also behavioral. It's also counseling. It's also support. And that's what we're alleging they were cheated out of that they were supposed to be getting 45 minutes of counseling. The government and others were paying for 45 minutes of counseling, and instead they were getting what I think would be best characterized as a brief check-in. Just check-in, just enough to, to check off a box somewhere, right? That you showed up here, it's enough to show Medicare, to get the paperwork processed, and, and that's how, that was the way business was done for all that time. We've alleged that that's the way business was done. In the PR today, Well, what I can tell you is that as of today, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have step taken steps to suspend federal health care dollars to this practice. Um, you'd have to discuss with the practice what their current operating conditions are. Can you elaborate on the number of dollars that were spent by the, the you guys, like the not you guys, but the medical companies paying for the services? Like how much? How much are we talking? Well, as I indicated, our estimate at this time is that approximately $15 million in payments were made over the life of the scheme. Uh, that's both private and federal. I can tell you that we are taking steps today to seize a number of bank accounts in addition to the assets that Special Agent in Charge Bonavolanta referenced, uh, including some bank accounts containing in excess of a million dollars. What are they looking at for penalties if they're convicted? That will be determined by the court uh, upon any conviction. Can you say something about Well, uh, I think I referenced that it started as a result of data analysis, which detected anomalies. We've referenced a couple of anomalies, including uh, the billing of what are called impossible days uh, and the billing uh, just generally being inconsistent with good practice. Did anyone step forward to contact your office? As I referenced, the initial impetus for the investigation was data analysis, and that was brought to the attention of the office and investigators. No, this is recovery connection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.